The Unshackled Waves, episode 99. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have you company. It's been another busy news week and to discuss it all we'll be joined by Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts in a moment. I hope you are continuing to enjoy our new Right Now segment. I did hope to get it out to you every weekday but that is not always possible as it does take a lot of time to prepare. I hope to get it to you at least three times a week as there is always news happening daily that needs commenting on. But now, on with today's show. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back to the show. Yeah, g'day Tim, it's good to be back for another episode. And we've both been quite busy lately, but um, we've been trying to keep up with the news as much as possible and there's certainly a lot still happening. Yes, uh, the citizenship debacle uh, continues, Queensland election time, Tragic terror attack in New York uh, and uh, craziness on Manus. So there is plenty to talk about. A lot of people expected the uh, dual citizenship saga involving our federal politicians to be over with the uh, High Court ruling uh, last Friday, but it actually opened up the possibility for more MPs to be knocked out because the High Court found that uh, ignorance was not a defence. So even though that Barnaby Joyce and Fiona Nash uh, didn't know that they were uh, dual citizens. It still still meant that they were ineligible to uh, sit in the federal parliament and that citizenship by descent was recognised as dual citizenship. So there is potentially now uh, other MPs in the parliament who uh, knowingly or unknowingly are dual nationals. And uh, we lost a another... A, MP this week with the no less than the President of the Senate, Liberal Stephen Parry, resigned when uh, on Wednesday after he confirmed that he did hold uh, British citizenship as his uh, father was from Britain. Uh, and now it's, it's opened up, uh, made the call stronger for a audit of the citizenship of all MPs because we were told by Attorney General George Brandis on the Sunday after the High Court decision uh, that there were no more dual citizens and yet there are. And so, you know, we, how else are we going to be sure that, you know, there's not going to be more? Well, there's no way to know. Uh, there's plenty of people who now are, um, who could be taken up by this. Um, Penny Wong, uh, one comes to mind, grew up in Malaysia, spent her first 10 years there. Um, well, Stephen Perry is, Perry, sorry, is the, the next man to fall uh, to this, but it just shows that the Constitution is a document to be respected. Uh, to be venerated and to be looked up to. And it doesn't matter if we we're in 2017, uh, this is a document that is a foundational document of our nation and it needs to be respected. And it doesn't matter how many politicians have to go uh, or recontest by-elections or, or whatever, what needs to be respected is the rule of law and the Constitution. And I'm very thankful that this... Um, this uh, uh, debacle arose because we can really test the rigours of our um, institutions, uh, the High Court, the Parliament, uh, and to see if they uphold the rule of law. So I personally do think that this is a good thing, but certainly it calls uh, a lot into question. And, and obviously the major parties are resisting this audit that Malcolm Roberts initially pushed because they are scared. Uh, that the government will collapse and, and quite frankly it is on the peril of some kind of collapse at the moment. I, I really don't mean to dramatise things but they, uh, with uh, Barnaby Joyce out, they, the uh, Liberal uh, Coalition, Liberal National Coalition, doesn't even have a majority in the House of Representatives. So there certainly is a lot to think about here. The longer that they resist uh, this call for an order, the the, uh, the longer the public's trust in the politicians is eroded because the 
what I've been hearing from, you know, just discussions online and that, that, you know, people, you know, they, they don't care that, uh, you know, this is causing chaos in the government. For them, it's about, you know, the rule of law. You know, politicians uh, make laws that, you know, the rest of us are, are supposed to obey, and yet they can't even follow the most basic law, which is the Constitution. Well, and then George Brand comes out and says that uh, is this Section 44, you know, an outdated relic in this, you know, great multicultural society that we live in? So you can't, you know, even as a as a young lad, well, we'd all realise that you can't change the rules to a game when you're going along to suit your terms. Um, and certainly you can't do away with Section 44 because it's causing you some headaches and uh, you didn't do uh, your due diligence. Uh, so certainly I think that there is some, uh, what would you call it, elitism here, where the people in the parliament don't think that the rule of law should apply to them uh, as it would uh, to any other Australian. So I certainly agree with your analysis there that in part it's not necessarily about constitutional snobbery, but it's that the one rule of law uh, uh, governs us all, and and I think it's as simple as that, and that's how most uh, middle Australians view this. Uh, and also the other um, politicians calling for an audit are the Greens, who uh, most people have pointed out are actually being the constitutional conservative throughout this whole uh, whole, whole saga, which is uh, quite ironic. Um, uh, Darren Hinch is also calling for an audit, so is uh, Nick Xenophon, and also some Liberal backbenchers such as uh, Craig Kelly, Eric Betts and Kevin Andrews have also called for an audit. Malcolm Turnbull today said that he'll have an inquiry, but we don't know whether that inquiry would compel MPs to provide uh, documentation, uh, for example. Yes, uh, I think that um, that this could, this audit could end up being a witch trial of some sort where uh, people exact uh, a vendetta on somebody else. Uh, because I'm, you know, the, the accusations uh, will go around in a in a round circle. Uh, there will be wheels within wheels and fires within fires. And I certainly do think that um, this could uh, potentially uh, grind Parliament to a halt. Uh, it could bring an early, probably should and eventually will uh, bring an early election. And I don't think that most people actually realise the severity of uh, this uh, this debate that's going on now, and um, the 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 other thing is uh, with the Greens is what you were saying before. Th this is a rare moment where we can um, I think let go of partisanship and actually realise that the Greens have taken uh, quite a morally righteous stand here. Uh, they have been the ones uh, to respect the constitution and the rule of law, uh, and it has been the major parties that have ignored it, who have disregarded it, and who have felt that it, why should it apply to them? You know, they, they feel that, uh, you know, they're too big for their own boots. You mentioned that an audit could be a witch hunt, but it's already a witch hunt. I mean, it was interesting, Matthias Coleman the other night saying that if, if, uh, any member of the public suspects say an MP might be a, a dual citizen, they're welcome to investigate, basically inviting the media and other people to you know, dig, uh, dig around. I mean, we already have a uh, witch hunt. And uh, I think an audit would just clear things up uh, once and for all, because this is important for yeah. the integrity of, of the parliament. I mean, even though it will be you know, messy, you know, we've got to seem to be a nation that is you know, upholding our constitution, make sure that uh, our laws are being passed uh, by people who are eligible uh, to be there. I mean, even if we do have to go into a, into a new election to, to make sure that, you know, this whole uh, sorry saga is cleared up, then so be it. I, I agree. I, I think put the, the heat uh, on them and the heat will melt all concealment and I think that the, the, the way to put the heat on these politicians to make sure that they follow the rule of law uh, is to conduct an audit. 
Uh, this was suggested by Malcolm Roberts, the, probably one of the uh, most honourable Section 44 um, pe you know, uh, politicians who have um, been victim to it. He, he put himself up to the High Court. Uh, he uh, left with his own integrity. And he also said that this uh, audit, uh, he suggested it, kind of got the, uh, the stone rolling, as, as if you would say that. Uh, and I think that it is a perfect idea. Uh, we need to uphold uh, the, the sliver of, of integrity that our parliament has. And the way to do that is through an audit, whether or not it ends in another election or not. Upholding uh, the, you know, the worth of the parliament, you know, is done through shining a light uh, on the Section 44 and not covering it up. There was another lone wolf uh, terror attack in the uh, West, though this time it wasn't in Europe, it was in uh, New York City where uh, a 32-year-old uh, Muslim from Uzbekistan, uh, Saifullo Saipov, he drove a pickup truck onto a bike path and uh, killed eight people, which included six tourists, and injured 11. He was shot by police. Is uh, still alive, which um, is, is somewhat surprising uh, after s such an attack. And uh, we found out afterwards that he'd been led into the United States on what is called a diversity immigrant visa. Now, it's certainly, I think, and, you know, I wouldn't blame Donald Trump if he said, you know, after this, I, I told you so. But, you know, he has been proved right that the United States needs to better control its immigration program. And you know, even though the, you know, as it's called, the travel ban was, you know, quite broad, it had the the right idea. And certainly, you know, e even though the United States, you know, doesn't have as big a Muslim population uh, as Europe, it, uh, this just proves that, you know, the, the United States just has to be as, as careful. I think that uh, no country uh, is, uh, you know, um, good enough to counter all of these uh, terror cells that are spread, you know, around the West and around the globe because they are so decentralised. Um, in some cases, one cell might not know about the other. And, and in the case of Britain as well, it's a surveillance state. You know, all liberties have been eroded. Um, so it is hard, in a sense, to actually stop all this terrorism through intelligence and in, information gathering. And sometimes you have to make a tough stand and say that, yes, 99% of uh, Muslims tend to be, you know, decent people, right? So do mo most people in general seem to be decent. But of course, uh, there is the 1% that can slide through and can conduct uh, murderous activities, such as this tragic mowing down of people in New York City with a truck. So I think that Trump, uh, in signing this executive order to uh, do away with this, uh, this form of uh, diversity visa, is a good thing. Uh, because, in a sense, all immigration should be done on merit. And uh, getting people in for the sake of them having a different religion, skin colour or culture is completely counterproductive. What you need in an immigration network is to vet, uh, vet people, make sure that they are law-abiding, uh, that they can work, and that their, their, rough, their rough ideas correlate with uh, Western ideas of of, you know, equality under the law and so forth. Um, but it does show that maybe Trump's actions uh, with the, the wide travel ban uh, was a correct thing to do because it is hard to, uh, to vet everyone that comes into a country, especially a country that is of 230 million people. Uh, tough stands need to be taken. I think the wall needs to be built as well. Uh, people can just pour through there. Uh, terrorism it would stop terrorism, would stop the drugs. But these lone wolf attacks and these decentralised cells are very hard to, to stop. And I think the way to actually stop these uh, terrorist attacks is to put a temporary ban on uh, immigration from terrorism hotspots. Trump did that. 
I think it's good, but we 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 all need to to t- t- take a, a hard look at this and uh, realize that it has happened through this uh, bleed heart left wing uh, let's let everyone in mentality, and it's completely counterproductive. I'm surprised that this uh, diversity immigrant visa, and apparently it's not the first time a person on this visa has committed a crime in the United States, that this wasn't one of the first things to go when uh, Donald Trump took office. I mean, maybe he didn't know that you know, it existed. I mean, he can't know you know everything, but he's he's made sure that it, that it's gone now. I mean, it, it's, it, it's the, the whole thing, it seems it's designed that... You know, we've got to, you know, make sure that the United States is, you know, co- uh, culturally diverse, which is, that's not the purpose of, you know, an immigration program. It's not for, you know, diversity. It's supposed to, uh, and I'll use this word properly, it's supposed to enrich a nation, to, to make sure that, you know, it contributes to their, you know, economy and, and both their, you know, security and their, their culture in, in a positive way. Well, for instance, in in Britain, uh, the Jamaicans, uh, you know, immigrated, and you know, it was a bit of a problem with crime at one stage, but they assimilated to British culture. You know, uh, eventually, you know, they played cricket. You know, they respected the culture. Uh, they assimilated. Likewise, with the the Asian community in Australia, many of them tend to be doctors, lawyers, very successful. There was there was a bit of you know, a um, uh, bit of friction there to begin with. But certainly I think we can see a pattern with these uh, largely Islamic communities is that they tend not to respect the law, a rule of law, uh, as much as some of these other groups that have successfully integrated uh, into Western society. They tend to create their own courts, uh, tribunal, tribunals in the form of uh, Sharia law and whatnot, and they tend to disregard Western law and Western custom. Uh, this all leads to isolation. Uh, they then the, the uh, ice, and then isolation continues through the education system, which they uh, largely disregard and disrespect. Uh, and this leads them to becoming uh, disenfranchised and susceptible to uh, brainwashing. So I think that this want to isolate themselves, uh, be pure, be away from the infidels. Uh, this is all creating uh, this culture of terrorism. Uh, and to, see, to stop this culture of terrorism, we must say either integrate or go back home. Uh, it's uh, it's always interesting. I have to highlight the the left because you know there was no doubt that this was an Islamic terror attack. I mean, they found an ISIS flag in the truck, and they also found a note pledging uh, his uh, his allegiance to Islamic State. All of a sudden, the left are now saying, "Don't politicize this uh, tragedy." Where if he'd had a gun, for example, they'd be saying, "You know, gun control uh, now." It's it's always. Uh, you know, when it when it doesn't fit their their you know leftist utopian agenda, they're like, oh, don't politicise it. You know, we need to more. But you know, if it, if it fits their agenda, then they're like, oh, you know, we must take you know action now. Well, that's true. You saw that with the terrorist attack uh, at the Orlando uh, uh, Dance Club in uh, Florida. Um, the there was um, a bunch of gay men shot up at the Pulse nightclub. Uh, and that, that was an interesting where that Islamic terrorism and that gun control, there was a fusion. Oh, what, what, what's, what, what, how do we politicize this? Was he, uh, was he forced to commit this terrorist act through the, uh, the uh, society that lacked compassion, that isolated him, or was it the guns? So, you know, that was an interesting crossroads there. But with the Orlando attack, we, definitely, there was a, we saw a spike in... Uh, the purchasing of guns from from gay people because uh, they wanted to feel protected. They understand that we are in an age of terrorism and that the state can't protect us all. So uh, I do think that uh, that uh, it is quite clear that it was an Islamic attack. Um, uh, it was a very low-grade attack, doesn't require much planning. Certainly I think that tragedy can... Uh, be undertaken through guns, bombs, trucks, 
it is not the, uh, the, the, the weapon itself that's evil or the tactic that's used. It's the ideology that is evil, and we need to realise that. Gun control, bollards don't work. It is tackling the evil and corrosive ideology of radical Islam that will make the difference. Uh, nobody is silly enough after this to call for uh, truck control because, you know, obviously, you know, we need, you know, trucks to, you know, transport things, uh, you know, we, which, you know, highlights that, yeah, as you said, it's, you know, it's not the, it doesn't matter what the weapon is, it's the person behind it. Yeah, for sure. And we need some common sense in this debate. We can't be pushing for for gun control or uh, for, for, uh, thinking that will make a difference or or more diversity, more immigration from terrorism hotspots will make things better. We need to look at the logic, we need to look at the facts, and we need to do what is best for our nation and what is best for the West. The Queensland state election has finally been confirmed after months of uh, speculation. Anastasia Palaszczuk last uh, su uh, Sunday, she visited the acting governor, I believe. She told us that she only intended to visit her nana that Sunday, but apparently she made a stop to uh, Government House as well to call uh, the election for Saturday the 25th of November. So it's happening relatively quickly. And it's going to be a three-way race between uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk's Labor government, the uh, Liberal National Party opposition, which Liberals and Nationals are one party in Queensland, uh, under their leader Tim Nichols, and also uh, with uh, One Nation, which is uh, polling roughly uh, 15 to 20 percent of the primary vote. Now, uh, Queensland only has uh, one House of Parliament. Uh, they don't have an upper house which is elected by proportional representation, but um, One Nation, because they are polling uh, so highly, they, they could win the, the balance of power uh, post-election. Now, both uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk and Tim Nichols are trying to uh, ignore the, uh, the One Nation factor. They're saying, you know, we're going for, you know, majority government, you know, we're not going to... They've ruled out any post-election deals or, you know, preference deals, which is, of course, is... Uh, very easy to do when you're in, a, in an election campaign, but post-election you can you know, probably guarantee that, um, or the Liberal National Party at least, would, would, would do a deal to uh, secure One Nation support. Yeah, and well, I don't really trust polling too much. We've seen Brexit, uh, we've seen Trump, uh, and, you know, according to a few articles that I read this morning, uh, the whole same-sex marriage polling could be wrong, and there's been a few people tipping a no win. So I, I don't go by the polling. I generally go by the betting market because where people are putting their money, I reckon that's where things are happening. Now, uh, the Liberal uh, National Party minority is at 260, and the uh, Labor uh, Party majority is at 230. So that's just showing how tight it is here. So the Liberal uh, National Party will be reliant on One Nation uh, and it, I think it is at a toss of the coin whether it's going to be uh, a One Nation holding the balance of power or whether a um, Anastasia will hold on uh, with her um, Labor Party. So it is quite close and I think that uh, the One Nation X Factor is quite interesting here in Queensland. Uh, and they'll definitely have a big part to play uh, in the rural kind of blue uh, collar areas that were traditionally Labor, but the Labor Party have left behind the miners, uh, the forestry workers, and they're all turning to uh, One Nation. So um, it will be uh, quite interesting. Obviously, places like Ipswich, where Paul and Hanson won, that, that, they're the kind of places I'm talking about there. But certainly there, there is a very, very good chance that One Nation will be forming, uh, will have the balance of power uh, in the uh, Queensland uh, uh, Legislative uh, Assembly. Now, uni unicameral system as well, there's, there's no legislative council or upper house. Uh, so if you hold a majority uh, in the uh, Legislative Assembly, 
uh, then you can pretty much get anything you want done. So this is a very, very important election for the state of Queensland. And uh, Malcolm Roberts is going to be the One Nation candidate for Ipswich, so that, that'll certainly uh, give them a, a good chance of uh, polling well in, in that area. Uh, now, Anastasia Palaszczuk, she, she's been an okay Premier, just uh, I'm looking at things objectively. I mean, you know, she has you know, good uh, approval ratings, even though she has grown the size of the, the public service. She's still uh, committed to a 50% renewable energy target, though she's not uh, pleasing all the greenies because uh, she's still helping to facilitate the Adani coal mine and uh, protesters against it keep following her on the, the campaign trail. And she's she, in the campaign, she's very she she wants to remind voters as much as possible of Tim Nichols' link to uh, former Premier Campbell Newman, which uh, the the Newman government in 2012 they were elected with a thumping majority. They won 78 seats out of uh, out of 89. Uh, many expected they'd be in power for uh, two three terms. Labor were reduced to you know seven seats. Anastasia Palaszczuk only got the opposition leader's job because uh, she was the only one left, but uh, Campbell Newman, because he had a really <laughs> aggressive, uh, you know, style, you know, picked fights where, with everybody. There was the, the bikey laws, which, you know, really, um, you know, scared people. He was turfed out after after one term, lost, he, lost his own seat, and uh, Palaszczuk was able to bring Labor uh, back from the brink. So she's proven herself a very uh, capable politician, and I do think that uh, I tend to agree with your analysis. It's either going to be her winning a, a slim majority or it's going to be a hung parliament with uh, One Nation uh, holding the, the balance of power. Now, Tim Nichols, he's, uh, he was the treasurer in the, in the Newman government. Uh, he's, he doesn't fill me with uh, you know, much inspiration. He's trying to play it very safe, saying we've learnt the lessons of the you know, Campbell Newman years. You know, we're going to, uh, he's focusing on nice things like you know, supporting small business, you know, investing in you know, education and infrastructure, uh, small, small target uh, strategy, which is, uh, it doesn't really give people much of a reason to, to vote for them as an alternative. Well, uh, it appears that uh, we are seeing a trend uh, towards uh, the Liberal Party becoming more labour light. Also a nationwide trend of, uh, probably since the days of Rudd Gillard, hung parliaments. Um, you know, one house controlling the upper house, well, well, sorry, one party controlling the upper house, one party controlling the lower house, uh, no stability. Um, no strong, uh, no strong uh, government at all, but I think that uh, it could either be very, very smart what the Liberal Party are doing, or very stupid because they might be playing it a bit too safe. Um, obviously, uh, they walk a fine line uh, because they are trying to. Bury the memory of the past of, of Campbell Campbell Newman, you know, a man who looked up to Sir Joe Bielke Peterson, uh, a, a man who was respected by the uh, Bielke Peterson family as well. So they're trying to do away with the the view of you know Campbell Newman, the the tough and assertive leader, and they just want the the blue blue tie wearing uh, family values, small business, uh, let's invest, in, you know, the typical platitudes, uh, the nothing happening message. Um, or they, they can vote for uh, Palaszczuk and Jim, she, she'll, uh, you know, keep selling off assets to uh, keep fun, uh, funding a broken system, uh, but she'll allow some development as well. So she's not completely re regressive. So it is an interesting... Um, a uh, case of events, or it's an interesting conundrum uh, here in Queensland, and certainly we'll be keeping a close eye on it as well. 
Uh, it's, it seems to be that the LNP, they've learnt the wrong lesson from the, the Campbell-Newman years, because I don't believe it was the, you know, the budget repair which the, the state um, desperately needs. I mean, I think state debt is now uh, $80 billion. I mean, bu budget repair has just gone out the window the past three years. The LNP seem to believe that they lost the last election because of budget cuts when, in my opinion, it was the, the bikey laws which, you know, really uh, scared, you know, the public because, you know, they were drafted in such a way where the government could declare, um, you know, a, a meeting of two people to be a criminal organisation and, and charge them. It was, it was really dr uh, draconian uh, laws. And then there was uh, other ridiculous parts of it, like putting bikies in pink jumpsuits, like just over the top, silly stuff like that. <laughs> I, I kind of like it and I think um, Campbell Newman's ideas would have uh, worked very well in a place like Singapore but unfortunately they don't work very well in a liberal democratic society like Australia. Uh, it is rather hard to uh, force uh, fully grown uh, middle-aged adult men on motorcycles to wear pink jumpsuits. Now the idea was interesting. Uh, he was clearly a man who rubbed people up the wrong way and the Liberal National Party have got to be really careful. They, they can't be labour light, you know, they can't um, cattle to um, union uh, pressures or, or the social progressive kind of Adani, uh, you know, nut movement. Uh, they need to stay true to their key message of small government uh, you know, low, low taxes, uh, controlling uh, budget, uh, running it in. Uh, they just need to uh, keep true to what the Liberal uh, National Cause uh, is known for. And they need to realise that the reason why Campbell Newman was voted out is because he abused his power and not because he was a Liberal. And I, I certainly do agree with uh, your analysis there, Tim. The federal government, in its uh, effort to empty out the uh, offshore detention centres and uh, finish uh, cleaning up uh, Labor's uh, mess when uh, they are in charge of uh, border policy, they've closed the uh, Manus Island Detet Detention Centre. Uh, they gave plenty of warning to the 600 men who are located there, but now the men are refusing to leave. Uh, they're claiming it's not safe for them in uh, Papua New Guinea. It's it's ironic that uh, the these men they they didn't want to be in this detention centre, and the uh, refugee advocates said, "Oh, we want them, you know, closed down." The government's doing that, but now they're saying they're uh, staying there. Um, and, and you can and you can see why that uh, why they're choosing to stay there is because they want to try and use this opportunity to pull a stunt and try and you know embarrass and uh, shame the government, claiming oh the government's you know cut off our water, electricity, our food, you know they're being cruel, they're you know uh, tor uh, uh, torturing them, uh, c of committing violence against them. I don't know how you know, closing down a centre is uh, violence, and so the refugee advocates, they're uh, ma making as much noise as they can again. Um, but, uh, and alternative arrangements have been arranged at other places on, on the island, so, you know, there, there, there has been um, so, something else arranged, so, you know, they're not just, you know, out you go and, like, you know, fend for yourself. Um, but, yeah, it's... The, the, this whole episode is just, you know, another, you know, attempt by, you know, the, these alleged refugees and their, their advocates to see if they can, you know, harass and intimidate the, the government to uh, back down. It's a classic case of the lawyer activist class, um, you know, uh, whispering into the ear, uh, of these migrants, giving them false hopes uh, to advance their own radical agenda. Uh, you also see, there's plenty of parallels, uh, I think the left in general uses these people as props to actually advance uh, a multicultural or diversity agenda or just a progressive agenda in general. Uh, the U.S. border wall, for example, uh, the, well, parts of it, that, that there's a wall, the U.S. border. Um, the, there's groups 
uh, apparent humanitarian groups that put you know, bottles of water and food out there and actually encourage people to cross. I wonder why they, they do that. I wonder what their motives are. And I wonder what uh, the motives are of these, you know, parent uh, humanitarians that uh, whisper in the ears of these uh, so-called asylum seekers um, and, and, and what they're actually trying to get at. Uh, they, uh, the government, should I say, has, uh, well, they, they've provided them with an opportunity to resettle in PNG. Um, they are free from the ravages of war. Uh, and they do have some kind of uh, support uh, outside of the uh, parameters of uh, the detention centre and they are free to go home uh, when the situation or settles wherever they've come, come from. Of course, there may be some who are political or uh, prisoners or who are from a religious minority who may not be able to go home and uh, they can stay in PNG. But there are plenty uh, of people uh, who could go back to Syria, who could go back to Iraq uh, in times in the future. And with Syria, for instance, we're, we're actually seeing more people come into Syria each year now than leave. So the situation is settling there. Uh, Assad, uh, who's got about two thirds of the country under his thumb, is consolidating with the help of the Russians and people will be going back. Um, they weren't invited. Uh, yes, refugee advocates making noise again for their own political gains. Uh, and what can you do? You need to be tough, but you need to be fair. And that's what I think we're doing here. And yeah, the only obligation that the Australian government has is to make sure that they're safe from political persecution. I mean, it's the, the government, you know, isn't obliged to provide them, you know, with uh, a five-star lifestyle in Australia. That's not the, the purpose of a uh, refugee program. And, you know, that's why the, the government is, like, if they are genuine refugees, they're not going to send them back home. They're going to resettle them into a, a third country. And the, the government, to its credit, and, you know, P Immigration Minister Peter Dutton's been outstanding on this, that uh, anyone who, you know, comes to, who has come to Australia by boat will, will never settle here because if, if they are allowed to, you know, come to Australia, you know, eventually, even if, even if it's after five years or so, that'll encourage the people smuggling trade again because the people smugglers will say, oh, you know, you may have to wait, you know, a few years in a detention centre, but you'll eventually uh, get to Australia. That's why the, the government is being so adamant here. Yes, and it's, um, I think it's good because we don't want people coming here on boat. Uh, we don't want children drowning at sea. We don't want to be facilitating, you know, a vile people smuggling industry. But we still want to be compassionate. I think, uh, from my uh, best recollection, Australia has one of the highest intakes of humanitarian uh, refugees or, or what have you on, you know, on humanitarian grounds. Um, quite frankly, uh, people who come here deserve uh, some basic services uh, that everyone else gets uh, who come to Australia, but uh, they also need to work, they also need to, to put out, you also should welcome them as well. And I, I just think this is obvious, this is common sense, but nobody should be afforded a five-star uh, accommodation or, or way of life, and certainly... I do think that this tough stand will stop people drowning at sea. Uh, and I think that we definitely need to uh, look at this as a great success, that, that, uh, that Tony Abbott and Peter Dutton uh, did. Uh, Turnbull uh, and then uh, Dutton continued. Uh, it's one of the great successes of this uh, Liberal government uh, Liberal coalition government uh, stopping the boats, stopping people drowning at sea and controlling uh, the immigration. And obviously immigration's been cut and I think it needs to be cut in half again, but certainly we are taking strides in the right direction.
And the government there, they're smart enough to know that, you know, the public is supportive of their position. I mean, let's remember that in 2013, the Australian voters, they turfed out a, a Labor government which had opened up the borders again, let in you know, 50,000 uh, vote people and elected in its place uh, the Abbott government, which uh, pledged to stop the votes and, you know, delivered on that promise. So the, the public has made it pretty clear, you know, what their stance is. And, you know, these, you know, refugee advocates can carry on, you know, all, the, all they like. But, but the fact is that the public, they want strong borders. They, they don't want us to turn into what Europe is, where, you know, millions of uh, migrants, you know, f uh, flooding in, you know, boats coming in uh, on a daily basis. No, uh, we don't, uh, we, but we are seeing European nations um, look to the Australian model of, of merit-based uh, immigration. You're also seeing Donald Trump uh, talking about uh, pursuing a merit-based immigration system as well. So I think that this strong uh, border protection uh, strategy has uh, been great because not only has it, uh, uh, you know, uh, preserved the sovereignty of our borders, but it has also been a great uh, example uh, to countries across the globe uh, who are struggling uh, with the effects of mass immigration that are straining their uh, welfare systems, their prison systems, um, and their kind of cultural fabric. So, I think that Australia, with the merit-based immigration system, uh, the resettlement of boat people, uh, is a shining light to the world on how to be tough but but fair uh, in this uh, in this uh, uncompromising, uh, you know, uh, war on terrorism that's happening as well. You need to be tough. You need to be vigilant. Um, otherwise, there will be attacks, as you have seen in Western Europe. Uh, as you have seen in America recently on the streets of New York. So the reason why we are safe is, be, is uh, the reason why we are safe is because we are not a complacent nation. Yeah, and it's de uh, definitely uh, one of, despite all the government's problems, it's one area which they're uh, doing you know, really uh, good work in the interests of Australians. But that's all we've got time for on uh, this week's uh, show. So thank you uh, once again, Jacob, for taking the time to, to come on the show again. Yeah, no worries, Tim. It's, it's, it's good to be back. It's great to have a chat. Um, and uh, if, if you're happy to contribute, I understand that the cost of living is high. People work. Uh, you know, you want to spend your money elsewhere. Uh, we're definitely not e-begging here, but certainly if you've got a few extra dollars laying around, uh, we'd, we'd really love Patreons to support our growth, uh, to get our message out there. Uh, and we'd also love you to subscribe, like, tune in, share our stuff. Uh, and we just like general feedback and uh, we'd like to stimulate a bit of discussion as well. So uh, leave a comment, share, and uh, just have a good week, everyone. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. I'm pleased to confirm we've got two upcoming live streams. The first is on Wednesday, the 15th of November, when the Australian Bureau of Statistics Marriage Law Postal Survey results are being released. The second one is on Queensland Election Night on Saturday, the 25th of November. Both outcomes are going to have a major impact on Australian politics in the near future, so I hope you can join us for some real analysis of the results, and I'll leave links to the event pages in the description. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.